I'm pleased to welcome everybody this afternoon to our final uh, class meeting for the, uh, the fall 2020 honors lecture series on um, civic virtue. Today is a special program because we have as our speakers, three of our very own students. We have Ashley Murphy, Matthew Paris, and Emily McTire, uh, all of whom have successfully defended their honors theses and have uh, graciously agreed to be our speakers today. I've asked each of them to speak for no more than 10 minutes to allow for time at the end for Q&A. In addition to these three presentations, there's a fourth presentation available by Audrey Creel, or a program rather, that uh, came out of, a th out of her honors thesis that she defended last year. So uh, you'll find that on the D2L page. So I'm going to ask each of our speakers to introduce themselves very briefly and then go ahead and give their presentation. And we will begin with Ashlyn. Hello everyone. Um, so my name is Ashlyn Murphy. I am a senior majoring in political science and I'm so excited to talk to you all. So I'm gonna share my screen and then get started. All right. So I'm here, as Dr. Phillips mentioned, I am here to talk about my thesis. Um, and so let's start with my research question. So my research question is, do certain factors determine whether a Southern Baptist church will possess a policy on responding to sexual abuse? So this is a bit of a bummer of a topic. But I understand that, but I promise it'll be worth it. So before we get into my findings, we're actually going to zoom in on two aspects of my research question. Um, so why I chose the Southern Baptist denomination to study and why I'm focusing on sexual abuse response policies. So with 14,813,234 members, the Southern Baptist denomination is the largest Protestant denomination in the world. So a lot of people are affected by the decisions that Southern Baptist churches make. The Southern Baptist denomination also has a congregational structure. So that means that the highest human authority in the Southern Baptist denomination is each individual church. There's no centralized human authority. Um, so this is different from the hierarchical structure of like the Catholic church where you have the Pope and the Cardinals and the archbishops and it goes all the way down. The Southern Baptist denomination does not have that type of hierarchy. There is the Southern Baptist Convention, which you all have probably heard of at some point, but they do not have much authority over their churches. They have no way to command a church to do something. The only thing they can do is expel a church for not aligning theologically with their beliefs. But even a church expelled from the convention can still operate and can still call itself a Baptist church. They really don't have a lot of authority. Additionally, um, Southern Baptist churches and congregational churches in general are largely ignored in research because they're difficult to study. They aren't one big entity um, like a hierarchical church. Um, it's more of lots of little ones. Yes, they do elite, align theologically, but the nuances are different. And again, there's, they don't all believe the exact same thing. Um, additionally, I am Southern Baptist, and so that also made them interesting to study for me personally. Okay. So why sexual abuse response policies? So sexual abuse response policies are policies that dictate how a church responds to an allegation of abuse. And so they help ensure that abuse gets reported. So I'm gonna share a couple of examples. Let's say there's a church and they have these policies written down. Um, they've consulted with resources and with experts to have a policy on how to make a report of abuse. Um, and so in that church, let's say a member discloses to their Sunday school teacher an accusation of abuse. That Sunday school teacher knows that policy, they know who to talk to. Each step is clearly dictated. That Sunday school teacher knows to talk to their uh, children's minister. Children's minister knows to talk to the head pastor. When to bring the police in is in that plan. When to involve other parties, when to involve the parents, that is all in that plan. No one person has a large amount of discretion. Let's say that same situation happened in a church with no policy. Let's say someone disclosed abuse to their Sunday school teacher. The Sunday school teacher, they don't know what to do. They talk to some of their friends about it after church and then they go to the children's minister. Children's minister isn't sure. They talk to the head pastor. Head pastor thinks, well, we wanna make sure it's true before we call the police. And so they bring in the accused, the accuser in, they ask maybe some personal questions. It can quickly become a messy and dangerous situation. Maybe they bring the administrative body from the church in and now they're having to, the accuser is having to um, 
provide very personal information to lots of people, it, it quickly unravels. We can bring in another layer. What if the person accused is the head pastor and they're the ones making all the decision here? How do you figure that out? So this shows that policies are extremely important and they're recommended by experts. Um, the CDC put together a packet uh, for institutions that care for children and they said, you need to have policies. Uh, insurance companies that work with churches, they all say policies are so important. But is this really happening? Are the, is that type of situation that I just talked about, is that really happening? Well, in 2019, the Houston Chronicle released an investigation into Southern Baptist churches, and they found that over 700 people had come forward as being abused by a Southern Baptist leader or member in the past 20 years. Now, 700 is not the number of people that have been abused. It's the number of people that have been abused that have come forward. Sexual abuse is largely underreported, so 700 is unfortunately most likely a low representative of the actual number. Um, but the reporters found that churches were handling allegations of sexual abuse internally. They weren't going to the authorities. They were trying to be the investigative bodies themselves. They also found a pattern of people going from church to church and able to um, abuse people at a church and then leave and go to another church and get hired there and then continue that pattern. Um, and so this is happening, unfortunately. And actually in the community I studied for my thesis, I found two instances of that very thing happening of people able to go from church to church. So when this article came out, the Southern Baptist Convention started creating resources to encourage churches to have policies. Because as we know, they can't force churches to have these policies. So they've been trying to encourage them to write them. And that brings us back to my research question. Are these resources working? Are these materials from the Southern Baptist Convention working? Or is it the demographics? The demographics influence whether they create a policy, the amount of women in leadership, the age of the church, how many people are there, or do they need to have had a prior experience to write, ever, to write a policy? That is what I wanted to know. And so to figure this out, I needed to talk to pastors. Um, and so I uh, contacted 50 Southern Baptist churches, and of the 50, 12 wanted to talk to me. So I conducted interviews with 12 churches, talked to their pastors, um, and I compiled all the data together and looked for patterns, and this is what I found. Large churches are more likely to possess sexual abuse response policies for two reasons. Their vulnerability to abuse is more obvious than that of smaller churches, and they have more resources to devote to writing policies. So let's break that down a little bit. So large churches have more people under their care. Um, if you have a church with a thousand people, you are more likely to have an issue than if you have 30 people in your church. Now that's not to say you'll never have an issue when there are 30 people. And that's not to say that smaller churches don't need policies, but your vulnerability to abuse is more obvious when you have more people in your church. When I asked the pastors of large churches why they decided to write policies, they all said that they didn't feel like they had an option. They felt like they had to. Additionally, with when you have lots of people at a church, you need more volunteers to run it. If you have hundreds of kids in your kids ministry, you're going to need more volunteers. And it's harder for um, leaders in the church to personally know and vet every single volunteer. So there's a little bit more risk. So the vulnerability, again, is just more obvious. When I asked the pastor of a smaller church why, why they did not have a policy, he told me that they had 60 people in their church and the same family had looked after the kids for 10 years. They all knew each other and so they didn't feel like they needed one. So it's, that's really the big thing. Their vulnerability to abuse in larger churches is just hard to ignore. Now let's look at the second reason. Um, large churches have more resources to devote to writing policies. Um, with almost all of the larger churches, they all almost all had an administrative pastor, and the job of that administrative pastor is to review policy and write new policies. They don't have to worry about finding volunteers and who's going to preach on Sunday. Their job is the pol our policy things. Um, but when I talked to a pastor of a small church and asked him why they didn't have policies, he said that they, he knew he needed them and he knew he needed to write them, but he was the only full-time staff member. And so he was trying to plan vacation Bible school and preach on Sunday, and he, the need just had not seemed pressing to him. And so larger churches are able to delegate those tasks amongst the staff, as well as pour more resources, more money into writing policies, as they also have larger budgets. So that was the, those were the main results I found. Um, and then I also found three points that are related to my research question. And so I'm just going to talk about those briefly. 
I found that um, churches are more likely to have preventative policies rather than responsive policies. Um, and so those are policies or procedures um, aimed at preventing abuse from occurring in the first place. So all of the churches I examined had some sort of preventative policy or procedure. And the two most common were the Billy Graham rule, which means that a man and a woman can't be in a room alone together unless they're married. Um, and the rule of three, which means a, an adult and a child can't be in a room alone together unless that is a parent and their child. Um, I even saw this when I did the interviews. Whenever I would go to a church, the, none of the pastors would meet in a room with me unless the door was open or they would meet in a room where people would walk through. So I saw that in action. I also found that response policies that these churches do have only apply to children 18 and under. None of the churches have policies that apply to adults, um, which was really interesting. And whenever I asked pastors about this, they were all surprised, they didn't realize. And I asked them, well, would your policies that apply to children apply to adults? And they said, oh, I hope so, but we're not sure. So there is a gap in the policies that exist for all of the churches I looked at. And finally, I found that most Southern Baptist churches are not impacted by the convention's efforts to encourage their churches to write policies. As I mentioned, the Southern Baptist Convention is really trying to get their churches to write policies but I did not see those efforts impacting churches, at least not yet. Only one of the churches said they were impacted by the Southern Baptist Convention at all. And when I asked the churches with policies why they wrote their policies, none of them mentioned the Southern Baptist Convention and their resources. And so while I think the efforts from the convention are important they and they should keep going, right now they're not impactful. So I'm gonna close and I'm gonna read two quotes. While I wrote this thesis, I was actually able to interview someone who went through the process of reporting abuse in the Southern Baptist Church. And the church actually did not have any policies. And this is how they described the process. I think what everyone thinks is right is not. I think the name of church thought they did the right thing. I really do think they thought they did the right thing, but it was the wrong thing. I don't know how to get people to understand what the right process is. It may be tempting for church leaders to assume that they would handle an abuse allegation well, that they could just figure it out on their own, they don't need a plan. But that assumption could end up causing harm to victims and to the church. Um, in 1 Peter, it instructs believers to be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. I believe that churches must be willing to shepherd their congregants that are victims of abuse. And one way they can do this is by creating policies that provide them with a clear path to justice. And this is why I'm passionate about this topic and why I'm so grateful that I got the chance to research it. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great presentation and a, a very important topic that uh, that you cover very well. Uh, this this is you. something that that really needs to be out there. And uh, uh, Dean Vile and I were very impressed with, with the work you with, that you've done already. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. All right, Matthew. Hi guys, uh, my name is Matthew uh, Paris. I am a senior and I'm an uh, English major. And so my, you know, my paper, uh, some of what I have might not be super helpful to a lot of you guys, but what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go through a very abbreviated version of my thesis and research and then go through like my methodology and hopefully some advice that I can give to some of you. Uh, might not be useful to everyone, but hopefully there's something you can use there. Uh, so my project is on, it's Tyler Kim New Heller and the Absurd Legal Novel. This is the abstract, which I'm not going to read, uh, but essentially I'm proposing a subgenre of literature, which I'm calling the absurd legal novel, which sort of takes absurdist ideas of the conflict between a meaningless universe and human beings who crave meaning and applying that to sort of critiques of legal systems and institutions. I'm using two books to examine this, uh, The Stranger by Albert Camus and Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. And what I'm arguing is that the absurd legal novel uh, teaches readers to think critically about the nature of power, who holds it, how they use it, who it is used against, and how it maintains itself. And that last point is very important. So how I did this was, uh, it's three chapters in an introduction. Each chapter just uh, is almost a little self-contained and takes on a specific piece of the project. Uh, so chapter one is on the stranger. Uh, it's an analysis of 
that novel, uh, which is about a man who uh, is on trial for murder, but the trial is very fixated not on the murder itself, but on how he carries himself out and how he's a sort of a social deviant, how he doesn't fit into social norms. And uh, early in the trial, the judge explains that he would take a scrupulously impartial view of the case. The verdict of the jury would be interpreted by him in the spirit of justice. Uh, and so this is sort of the two main principles of the court, impartiality and justice. And in fact, one leads to the other because uh, the people involved in the court can look at the facts impartially, they will automatically come to the most just conclusion. And that's sort of the idealized platonic ideal of what laws and court should be. But the, what Camus, the author is arguing, is that true impartiality is impossible when you're specifically setting out to judge a person. And that's what happens in the novel. Because again, the protagonist isn't judged for the actual criminal act that he committed, but for being a criminal at heart, which is just him like smoking cigarettes and like not caring all that much about his friends. Uh, the next chapter is on Catch-22 and what I call weaponized absurdity. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, uh, well, let me take a step back. So Catch-22 takes place during World War II and it's about a bunch of military airmen who are kind of pawns in this very uh, nebulous military bureaucracy. And this bureaucracy uh, abuses language and logic and many of its you know, policies and laws. And they often create these results that are absurd, but they also maintain this hierarchy of power. A good example is the titular Catch-22. Uh, and essentially it goes something like this, uh, an airman, so someone who flies the planes, uh, they can be excused from duty if they are cl clinically deemed insane. Uh, all they have to do is ask. But if they ask to be excused from duty and they're demonstrating a sort of drive for self-preservation, which means that they are on some level rational, which means they're not insane, which means they can't be excused. And so it's this circular sort of uh, policy that means they can't be excused from duty. So they have to just keep flying missions. And that's how a lot of these sort of catch-22-esque policies work. They maintain certain power uh, hierarchies uh, and deny uh, individuals of their agency. And the third chapter takes a look at real life American legal institutions uh, to find certain similarities. And one example that I found particularly interesting is qualified immunity. And qualified immunity is very confusing. So I apologize if this doesn't make sense, but essentially what it is, is a legal process wherein uh, say, if a police officer does something unlawful and they get sued, qualified immunity is this policy in which uh, that case can be thrown out of court. Uh, and the idea is that because certain legal matters are kind of nebulous and gray, you don't want to deter police officers from doing their jobs. Uh, so they can be excused uh, from essentially accountability. And the benchmark for that is that the police officer uh, has to still be acting reasonably, even if they weren't necessarily acting lawfully. And the problem is that is that uh, in so many like court cases and Supreme Court cases, the concept of what is reasonable was expanded so much to where it's functionally meaningless. Uh, so now a police officer, uh, if they could have reasonably thought that they were acting reasonably, it kind of doesn't matter what they've done, their uh, actions can be excused. And so there's an obvious problem with that because most people will, when asked, claim that they were acting reasonably. And so because that burden is on them, it makes police accountability impossible, functionally impossible, uh, which is a problem as we've seen in recent protests and whatnot. And that abuse of language is something that we actually see in Catch-22, so that's very relevant. Uh, another aspect of law that I looked at is immigration law, which uh, as some of us might know was notoriously Byzantine and convoluted. Uh, and there's even its own example of a catch-22 where like most people who are you know, here illegally, they didn't sneak into the country, their visas have just expired. And so if they wanted to be legal citizens again, they would have to leave and then come back. But if an undocumented immigrant leaves, then they trigger a three to 10 year ban from re-entering the country. So they can't do that. So they're just kind of trapped here. Uh, 
as non-citizens, which maintains a hierarchy which disadvantages them. Sorry, I got dry mouth. There's even this thing called public charge where if someone is letting people come into the country, if they think that they might be a public charge, which means if they might use some um, social services like uh, Medicaid, uh, you know, disability, stuff like that, then they can just say, no, sorry, you can't come in. And so obviously that heavily disadvantages certain people from even coming into the country, which is very uh, similar to the stranger because it relies on snap judgments of people instead of a holistic view of who they are. And it kind of discourages empathy in favor of, uh, again, gut judgments. So my methodology, reading, mostly reading, Again, I'm an English major, so most humanities paper will probably fall under this. Uh, I mainly paid attention to anything relating to these legal institutions uh, and just highlighted those. As for secondary sources, I researched legal journals and news articles and kept my eye out for any uh, contemporary discourse about policies being absurd or being a catch-22, which is how I came across some of those things that I just mentioned earlier. Another thing I'd like to point out is that I didn't write a 70 page thesis because if I went into it thinking of it as a 70 page thesis, I would sit in the corner and cry. I thought of it as writing three 15 to 20 page papers and then putting them together with an introduction. And so each month I just focused on one thing, didn't think about the other parts. And then when I was done, I just went through all of them and found the through lines, found out how I can make it a more a uh, unified and cohesive uh, paper. Uh, advice for early stages. Most of this has probably been covered with you guys. Uh, obviously pick a topic you're passionate about. When I was starting this, I was interested in going to law school. I'm not so much interested in going to law school anymore, but I'm still interested in uh, analyzing the sort of laws and institutions and policies that uh, guide us and how they fail because they very often do. Second is find a good thesis director. They have to be knowledgeable about what you're talking about. I was very, very lucky because we have a professor, uh, the wonderful Dr. Renfro, who teaches a class on law and literature. So there was literally no one else that I could have picked uh, because it had to be her. And she was also very accessible, which is good. So if you're thinking about asking one of your teachers to be your uh, thesis advisor, but they take like over a week to respond to your emails, maybe reconsider that. Uh, advice for writing itself, uh, find the so what of your thesis, like the most meaningful implications, what you want your reader to get out of it. For me, that was a third chapter on uh, the real world implications of these novels. Uh, when I realized that was what I, kind of the main thrust, the main idea of my thesis, I reoriented the rest of it, the rest of it to uh, uphold that. Uh, that third chapter, is the ammunition, the rest of the thesis is just the delivery mechanism. So think of that when writing your thesis, like what you want the readers to get out of it. Uh, and this is like the most practical bit of writing advice I have. Anytime I was writing, I had three documents open. I had one where I just had my source and then all the quotes that I might possibly use. Then I took those quotes and put them in an outline with my own commentary. And then after that, uh, writing the actual chapter is no problem. Uh, do keep track of your sources. Uh, I started pulling new sources to fill gaps in my thesis, but I forgot to add them into my source document. And so when it kind of <laughs> came time to make my work cited, I had to scramble to find every source that I had used. Uh, so keep track of those. Uh, and also just set reasonable goals and deadlines. Again, I did a chapter a month uh, and uh, you got to pace yourself. So I didn't start each chapter on the 25th. I uh, did just a little bit of work, uh, you know, every week, and eventually that'll come together into a full thesis. And when you hit a deadline, don't be afraid to give yourself a break, to celebrate, to kick your feet up, and just allow yourself that victory before heading into the next thing. That's it. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, excellent presentation and, and really an outstanding thesis. Um, if Matthew had, had had limited his thesis simply to a, a critical analysis of, uh, of Camus and, and Heller, I think it still would have been a very effective uh, and very satisfying thesis. But 
uh, his thesis went went beyond that in looking at the real world implications of that and current current issues and examples of the absurd. So um, it's, it's a thesis that really caught my attention. Of course, I'm an English professor, but one of my goals is to have representatives from different areas of, of uh, different different disciplinary um, perspectives here. So uh, this is an example of, a, of an outstanding uh, thesis in the humanities. So uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Our third speaker is Emily. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you guys for those great presentations, too. Um, I really enjoyed hearing about all of those. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Emily McTire. I am a video and film production major. Um, and my thesis project is a bit of a passion project that has kind of continued to develop over the years. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here real quick um, and get into it. There we go. Okay, cool. So, um, like I said, this this project it's called Vanderbilt. Um, it's a it's a series, a television miniseries. The script uh, for that. Um, it's a world that I've wanted to create for many years now, and I'm just very thankful to this thesis track and the resources and advisors that MTSU has given me in order to create this project the way that I have seen it in my head for so long. Um, but before I jump into the process, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of Vanderbilt. Um, if you know that name, Vanderbilt, it's probably in relation to the university in Nashville. It was named after Cornelius Commodore Vanderbilt, um, who had donated a large sum of his inheritance to the school. Um, two generations later, though, we get George Vanderbilt, who is this kind of worldly, observant, bookish young man who wants more than anything to stay out of the Vanderbilt limelight. Um, when George was 26 in 1888, he and his mother Maria traveled to Asheville, North Carolina, um, a common vacation destination for a lot of New England city folks. Um, and there he found this giant tract of land that would one day become the land of his own Biltmore estate, which still stands today. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the place. Um, my thesis, Vanderbilt, like I said, were the scripts for a television mini series that follows George's journey of creating Biltmore. Um, it details the aspects of his life and others that came to uh, build this legacy for the Vanderbilt name, for Asheville, and for Biltmore Estate. Um, while it is grounded in history, it is a historical fiction drama series. So um, the purpose of creating a fictionalized show of this piece of history was to not only tell the story of this fascinating family, um, but to also provide perspectives on societal struggles that we still see today. Um, I believe that historical fiction as a genre is characterized by its ability to take its audience back in time. Um, they can reassess these present day issues that we face in a new framework and get a bit of perspective there. Um, so Vanderbilt acts as another voice in modern day conversations of gender, race, and class. Um, and it's all told through this grandiose and romantic tale about the Vanderbilts on screen. Um, there is a short story written in an old journal of mine that's dated July 23rd, 2016, which was the date of my first trip to, Van er, to Biltmore Estate. Um, I scribbled it down in haste to not forget it, and it reads kind of like a group of scenes from Julian Fellows' Downton Abbey. Um, some of you might be familiar with that as well. The, that first trip that I took to Biltmore, I was just enamored with the place and I wanted to learn so much more about the lives of those who would walk the halls both upstairs and down. So I've lost count of times that I've been over to Biltmore collecting anecdotes and details to really flesh out this world. Um, I started adding to that short, that initial short story. Um, I, and then I decided to choose this as my thesis track. Um, and it kind of turned into this research uh, crusade, I guess, where I was scouring books and articles and eventually archives in order to nail down all the little tiny details of Biltmore and George's world. Ultimately, Vanderbilt is the result of years of experience, passion, and research. The story seemed to kind of naturally mold into this fictionalized epic, and it's grounded in history, but it's something that has captivated me for many years. Uh, so like I said, this project is the culmination of a lot of research, a number of trips to Biltmore, and many, many hours staring at my computer's blinking cursor. Um, one thing that I really loved about this project was the interdisciplinary nature of it. 
um, like you can see here, I kind of combined different areas of history, film, and English to um, create this story, not only technically, but also on a conceptual level. Um, and all of the different kind of prongs of the story are interrelated and they kind of bounce off each other to develop it. Um, I wanted it to be something that was entertaining and educational and enlightening all at once, which meant that each aspect, um, like I said, would kind of influence each other. I knew that I had to know the story's world like the back of my hand before I could get into the visual metaphors and um, you know, nailing down the formatting of screenplays and things like that. But the first task was uh, meeting and understanding my characters. So when I first started working on this show, the story was told from George's point of view because that's the point of view I was familiar with after the trips to Biltmore. Um, as I looked deeper into his background though, I discovered that he was an incredibly private person. Um, he wasn't secretive or stingy or anything, but he was very soft-spoken and often the wallflower. Um, so coming from a writing perspective, he wasn't a really compelling main character. I wanted somebody there to help start conversation and conflict and to work with and against him. And that is where Edith Dresser came in. Um, Edith Dresser, who spoilers would one day become Edith Vanderbilt, um, is the other side to George's coin. She's forward thinking, a woman in her early 20s at the turn of the century. And although she knows her place in high society, she uses it to help others, not herself. She's generous and helpful, lending a hand and building community wherever she can. And while other women are hosting suitors to dinner, Edith goes on without the need for a man to show her how to live her life. She, in the end, only wants a loving counterpart who matches her confidence and generosity, intelligence, and progressivism. Um, without her, Biltmore wouldn't hold half the legacy that it does today. Her perspective adds so much to the story itself too and keeps George's in check. They balance each other and make for really dynamic storytelling. And so while these two characters are really great, I wanted Vanderbilt to represent more. I love Downton Abbey and it was one of the great writing influences for the show. Um, but I, I did notice as I watched it, um, it doesn't really show much of a perspective outside of those on the rich estate. I wanted Vanderbilt to bring more to the table and represent a wider audience and get uh, show the voices that have been kind of painted over in history. So that is where Harry, Henry Turner, sorry, came from. Um, Henry, unlike George and Edith, did not actually exist. He's a character that I created myself. You'll notice this photo up here on the uh, presentation. This is Caleb McLaughlin, who you might know as Lucas <laughs> in Stranger Things. Um, this is not Henry Turner, but he was a good uh, visualization for me as I was writing to kind of see how his character would live in the space. Um, but I wanna tell you a little bit more about his character itself not just the visual aspect. Um, Henry is a culmination of a number of stories that I found through my research, a vessel to explore coming of age and societal conflicts of this time period. When I was creating Henry though, I was staying very conscious of my inherent biases as a white woman. Um, obviously I can't claim to know Henry's entire experience. So I did as much research as possible to develop him for the show. Um, but moving forward, I continue, I want to continue working on this project. And part of that is um, working with co-writers and sensitivity readers to make sure that he is represented as accurately um, and as powerfully as possible. So then the second task of creating this world was establishing the setting, um, physical, historical, and social down to the very details. Um, as I mentioned, while the story is fictionalized, it's grounded in recorded history. So Vanderbilt's setting and a large majority of its characters did actually exist. Um, to do them justice, I got as close as I could to their personal lives through research. I partnered with MTSU's Undergraduate Research Center and was awarded a Eureka grant to travel to Asheville, where I did some archival research with UNC's uh, Ramsey Library in Asheville and the PAC Libraries in C Room. Um, I entered both of those arenas kind of with one overarching goal in mind that I was there to learn about Biltmore's impact. Um, I had three set, kind of like subcategories of impact that I was looking at, um, the environment, the economy and society of Asheville um, before and after Biltmore moved in. So with these areas of interest, I knew that I would be able to better represent George's legacy and back it up with historical evidence. And I uncovered a lot in that research that I, had not really expected. Um, and I think that the show and the story really benefit from that um, revelation. 
So I saw statistics that backed up George's love for forestry and his work with the landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, that is a really big kind of underlying uh, theme throughout the, the story. It, it charges a lot of George's character. Um, the estate grounds, whenever George first bought them, were basically dust and rock. Um, nothing could be grown there. And now today it's this beautiful lush forest. Part of it has been allocated as the Pisgah National Forest as well. Um, I learned a lot about Asheville's economic track record as well. Um, industry had boomed after Biltmore arrived. The estate provided jobs that initially didn't exist, um, and it established a wide range of local business trading opportunities through on-site industry as well. And Asheville has always been known as a, a hub of tourism, which is why George and his mother first uh, traveled in the first place. Um, but after people got word that a Vanderbilt had put down roots in Asheville, everyone flocked to the country to see what it was all about and thus bolstered the economy. Um, since Henry is such a crucial character, like I said, I wanted his background to match the intri intricacy of George's or Edith's. Um, so in order to learn more about his life, I focused on studying a lot about the African-American uh, population in Asheville from 18 to 1900. Um, I was surprised with the volume of research that I found in this area, actually. Prior to the archival research, the extent of anything that I found was um, in the discussion of the land that George had bought for Biltmore. Um, when he bought it, he bought a lot of Black farmers off of their land, and that was kind of where that explanation stopped. There wasn't much more. Um, but in the archives, I spent a day and then some sifting through photos and handwritten documents, typed documents, all about African-American history in Asheville that had just never been published, largely unpublished uh, materials that I was able to use to kind of build more context for Henry and his coming of age story within Vanderbilt. Um, all of this just reaffirmed my belief that uh, Biltmore has this legacy that's full of so many voices and it's not just George's story alone to tell. So that was kind of the the big wealth of information that I gathered over time, um, it kind of built to a head here. And now that I had all of this information, I was tasked with, or I tasked myself with uh, turning it into a television show. Um, I, at one point, had considered writing a novel instead, just because of the amount of detail in this, but I also knew that it would be a stunning visual story. So I wanted to keep it on television and, um, in the end, I, you know, I, I know the media industry well, and this project is something that I can carry forward in my professional career as well, and work with other writers, producers, directors, um, and you know, turn this into something that could one day be on screen. For now, though, I wanted to wrap up today um, talking a little bit about the steps that I took in compiling this information into a fictionalized retelling of Biltmore's creation. Um, using the historical events, uh, the historical events that I found, I kind of built the skeleton of a show. Um, Biltmore's construction especially kind of dictated the structure of the episodes um, because it dictated whenever George would be traveling to be with Edith or when he'd be in Asheville to be with Henry, and then simultaneously when Edith and Henry would eventually meet at Biltmore as well. This visual construction of Biltmore also kind of mirrors the construction of relationships, which I think those interpersonal relationships really drive the story itself. Um, so the one thing that kind of alters from my historical side of this project is that as a writer, I did have to take some liberties um, whenever I was creating the timeline just for dramatic purposes. I wanted, like I said, for this project to be something that would be entertaining to audiences as well. And um, so for example, George and Edith, their relationship, they only in real life dated for six months before getting married in Paris. And so if I had followed history exactly, Edith wouldn't even be in this, show, in this TV show. So um, like I said, I, I kind of used history as the skeleton to build the rest of it and filled in the gaps with entertaining and engaging content. Um, I do believe though that this kind of structure is a much more dynamic one than if I had just written straight from a textbook or written off history entirely. Um, while I did alter time and character for the show, uh, not all of it, not all of the history was changed from its original source. 
many individual scenes were based on small anecdotal finds that I found in this sort of scavenger hunt of history. Um, and some of those scenes are my favorite ones. And I think they're some of the most special ones that really drive the story. Um, sadly, there were some details that I did, had to leave, did have to leave out um, just because they didn't help the show's overall narrative. Um, I did, however, include the ones that made the world a more complex and tangible one and sparked this further discussion that I want um, coming out of the show. So one last thing here, I, uh, this is a quote from episode two and I think I'll let you all read it, um, but I think that this kind of encapsulates a big theme throughout the show, um, chiefly that we all want to find happiness and to find our place in life. Ultimately, I, I wanted Vanderbilt to bridge the gap between the past and the present. And I believe that it's this beautiful and integral part of history, especially in this kind of Western North Carolina Appalachian area um, that's often overlooked. The plot is also a rich framework where we can analyze today through the past. Um, we can talk about issues of racism and gender inequality and media in America. And Vanderbilt is a way that we can see where we have been while understanding where we are and where we can go next as well. Um, but overall, <laughs> one of the big things that I want people to take away from this series going forward is that Biltmore is much more than just a beautiful mansion, a castle on the hill. It is the anchor for a legacy of community, curiosity, and empathy. And those are all ideas that we can still learn from today. So. Thank you all for letting me share today. Thank you, Emily. Uh, another outstanding presentation. Um, Emily's thesis is more than um, the building blocks for the world that she just discussed and the and the the narrative, but it it also includes and is comprised mostly of a whole season of episodes that that build on the research, the historical and archival research that, that she did. It's, it really is a remarkable project and it's, uh, uh, it's very well written. I can totally see this on television. Of course, I, I, I picture Downton Abbey uh, simultaneously as I recall trips to the uh, Biltmore estate myself, but it, it, it's very well done. It's a very good example of, of what you can do when you have different disciplinary interests and you haven't you have an idea that you're passionate about all of these things converged in this project and she had the opportunity to go uh and and do archival research and i guess uh, the best way to say it is that she's able she was able to experience what researchers in often revel in and that that is the the serendipity that is going in with an idea of what what she wanted to do and what she wanted to to find and what she wanted to study but then being open to whatever emerged in that process and it's often those things that just emerge in the, in the in the course of doing research uh, that lead to our most interesting um, findings so uh, thank you emily uh, all three, all three of you, uh, congratulations! Uh, very, very well done. Um, I want to open the floor in the in the time that we have remaining to the students in the class. Uh, please, uh, anyone who wants to ask a question, either about the projects or about the process or anything, um, please, uh, please do so. I am curious of what the actual process of defending your thesis is like. Uh, Ashlyn, I've kind of followed yours very obviously, but um, just the process itself of defending a thesis seems very scary and like amorphous as far as the structure of it. So if you guys could give us insight on how it worked for you, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I think it might be different for each person, but for me, the actual thesis defense is not as scary as it seems. Um, at that point, you've already finished your thesis, and so the hard part's over. Um, and I kind of came to it with like, it's done. And I don't think there are any big problems because my advisor would have told me. So whatever is said today, I know that it's done. Um, and really, it wasn't that difficult. Like the defense, it was, um, they just asked, Dean Vile asked me questions, asked me what I learned. He asked me some specific questions about my thesis. 
um, and then just asked me about if I could do something different, what would I do, as well as how would it um, help me in my future plans. And so I would say that don't be nervous about the defense, prepare for it well, make sure you know your information inside and out, ask your advisors um, how, best you, how uh, best you could prepare for it. But at that point, you're already done. So don't, don't let that one, don't let the defense scare you. Yeah, uh, I would agree that it sounds scarier than it is because you hear defense and you think, oh, so I'm going to have to like stand my ground and like, you know, justify my decisions and my choices. I won't let them say anything bad about my thing. That's not what it is. It's just a conversation. Uh, they're just like, oh, so like this, that's how mine went. Anyway, it was just more conversation about like uh, the project, uh, how I might expand it in the future, my methodology. Uh, you know, it really just felt like I was talking about something that I had learned uh, to people who were interested in hearing more about it. So uh, I don't think you guys need to worry and like, you know, uh, prepare to fight or anything. It's just, it's just a nice chill, like kind of, uh, what's where I'm looking for? can't think of it. My major's words. This is embarrassing. Uh, it's a nice sort of refresher, just a cool down. It's a cool down for uh, after you've done all the hard work, uh, just kind of the calm down from that. Yeah, I think I echo what both of you said. Um, but Ashlyn, especially, I want to build off something you mentioned. I think I, I was very nervous about it personally, because um, I didn't really know exactly what to expect. And I had prepared a little bit with my advisors, done like a kind of trial run of it, um, just to talk about all of my ideas based on the questions we were given. Um, but I did, I did want to mention that I ended up kind of entering into the defense at the point where, like you said, like it's done now. And I framed it more from my own perspective of like, this is a chance now that I get to share my, you know, my motivation and my passion for this. Um, and think of it more as like a celebration of, you know, finishing all of that hard work and getting to finally share it with other people. Um, so I think that, you know, you enter into it with a positive mindset and it is just a conversation about all of your hard work. Um, and yeah, it, you don't have to, like Matthew said, you don't have to like stand your ground completely, but do you know what you're talking about? Do you know your project? Um, and at that point, you definitely will. Yeah, very often the, the best uh, thesis defenses are ones that become conversations about the thesis. And I know, I know that that was the case with uh, Matthew and, and Emily um, because I, I was involved with yours. Um, one word that I've heard uh, over and over again is passion. And I, I think that's an important word to stress that when you're in the process of determining what your uh, thesis topic, your creative project is going to be, you want to choose something about which you are passionate, something that you yourself are motivated to learn more about, to express or whatever it is, and that you choose your thesis director carefully. Ideally, ideally it should be someone who, uh, with whom you've worked before, someone who knows you and your work, who's supportive of you, but also somebody who's accomplished in, in his or her field, somebody who can really help you move up and, you know, and, and uh, achieve the, the, in most cases, things that you couldn't even have imagined before. But somebody really uh, who is committed to you, uh, someone uh, who will meet with you regularly, uh, that's the best recipe for success. And I think all three of our speakers today have talked about how important their thesis director was the how passionate they were about their about their topics and and that's right if you've done all of those things and your thesis director says you're ready to go then when you when you start your thesis defense it's not about you know you know fighting off someone as Matthew was saying you know it's an opportunity for you to share what you've done and for you to respond to questions and for it to become more of a conversation. Okay, are there other questions from people? I had a question for, it's mainly for Ashlyn because she actually interviewed the churches. So I know you said you reached out to 50 and only 12 wanted to talk to you about it. My thesis is more with like 
dental offices and I would be interviewing dentists. And I think my struggle is how did you handle that? Like, did they reply to you and say, no, I don't want to talk to you. The other ones that didn't, or were they usually always willing to like help or help in some way? Yeah. So, um, most of them just didn't respond at all. Actually, I only got one or two people say no. Most of them just didn't respond. Um, now, part of it, I did interviews in June. And so at that point, we were, churches were just now coming back into meeting. And so I think that might be part of the reason. Um, but as far as figuring out um, how to get responses, I think the biggest thing I would say is don't be afraid of being annoying because I was. I was so afraid that I was going to annoy them or be too much of an inconvenience that when my thesis advisor told me to email them three times, I was very afraid to. And, I, and so I was very hesitant to reach out multiple times. But then whenever I did the interviews, I realized, okay, I'm taking 30 minutes of their time. I'm coming to them or I'm calling them. And so that would be my biggest thing is that when you're reaching out to those dentists, realize that you're really not asking a ton. Don't, you know, don't say that in your email, be as polite and as kind as possible, but realize it's okay to reach out a couple of times until you do hear back from them. So that is a huge part of it. I have a question too, and anyone can answer this. Um, I was just curious, like, did any of y'all have like really like, like roadblocks in your research? Like, were there certain things you were looking for that you couldn't find? Or like, did you hit a wall in some area that, you know, and, and I just want to get any recommendations you have for if you come across things that give you difficulties with completing your research in the ways that you wanted to? I actually, I successfully defended my thesis this semester as well. And back in the spring when I did my proposal, I had a certain research question I was planning on doing. And when I found to look at, it was on media articles, it was like a media analysis. And I found that there weren't as many articles to use towards my topic that I thought there might be. So I kind of had to redirect my thesis question more to academic research and then media research under that as well. So you kind of just, instead of doing it like all at the last minute, you need to do the research to see if you have those, those things available to you in order to do the research before you start your thesis. To, piggy, to piggyback off of that, uh, I just submitted my thesis proposal and I think the best thing to do is also look at your question and see if it's a bit too broad or if it's a bit too specific because sometimes that can lead to you having trouble being able to answer it, being able to find the answers you want. See, I guess look at the realism of your question. Uh, so for example, for mine, it was a question of, one of them was uh, how big to include uh, everyone I wanted in for me, my, so I did a study that had a survey in it, and I found I wanted. I started out talking about all college students, and I found that it was easier for me if I shrunk it down and did MTSU because obviously the data would be more accurate, and you know I, I could get more participants from it. So uh, I would look at the question you are asking and determine if it's too broad or too specific for you to get the answer that you're looking for. I also think if you do reach a block, your thesis director is there to also help you through that. That's not entirely their job, but they're there to help you find your way. Yes, your and Emily and Matthew, please chime in. But um, if you agree or disagree, but in my experience, like my thesis director and second reader, they were just so valuable because whenever I did hit those roadblocks, they had, they had done so much research of their own. They had already hit similar ones in their experience and they knew how to help me get out of there. I ran into an issue with my question, uh, with my research question in the beginning, because I knew the idea I wanted, but as far as formalizing it into a actual thing I could do research on was difficult. And so my advisor was able to not tell me what to do, but give me the framework to try and figure out my question and to give me resources and books to read. Um, and so, in those situations, when you do hit roadblocks, don't be discouraged. It doesn't mean your project is bad. It just means you need to go get outside help, which we all do throughout this project. Yeah, I agree completely on that. Um, and I do think your thesis director is a really, really great resource, immediate resource for that. Um, I feel like my situation is probably a lot different than a lot of you all, um, just because it was like a, a kind of a question that I could bend because I was the one writing it and 
it was fiction. Um, so I could kind of change it. But there were some things like in my research um, on the historical side that could have been complete roadblocks in my story because I wanted it to, you know, at least accurately represent the time. Um, and one big thing, for example, that I ran into was I came across a handful of newspaper clippings um, that said that George was engaged to somebody in like 1889, um, which was a year after my story started and before he had even met Edith, who he would later marry. And so that could have completely derailed my story, but there were ways that I worked with my director in order to kind of make that part of the conversation in the story because George hated media coverage and it was like he was you know kind of a Kardashian of the time or something like he was all eyes were on him and so rumors were spread all the time um, so that's how I kind of worked that bit of research into the project um, so it was still represented but it wasn't going to derail the entire project if that makes sense um, I think to apply it to different areas um, if your question that you're going into your thesis with is that kind of right balance of specific but not too um, you know broad but not too specific at the same time like you are able to kind of fluctuate with the information that you find preliminary um, and you know kind of reframe maybe your direction for further research if that makes sense Okay, well, we are at the hour, so I don't want to keep people past time, uh, but please join me in, in thank, thanking, at least virtually, our three speakers for today. Uh, very, very good job. And um, what a pleasure it was to have all of you in my class this semester. Uh, I hope to, uh, hope to see many of you uh, in the future. And those of you who are graduating, stay in touch with the Honors College because we want to know what you're doing. We want to know what you're up to and, and, and what you accomplish in life. So again, great seeing everybody. Enjoy the Thanksgiving break. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all.